I love beauty in all its forms. It is one of my highest values and I have been drawn to it since I can remember. But I can't say why or even what it is in the first place. So in this video, I'm going to explore this concept a little deeper in order to understand what this force, this power is that attracts and affects us so much. And in the interest of avoiding beating a dead horse, I'm going to attempt this discussion without overly focusing on the objective, subjective, eye of the beholder stuff. Are there things we all find beautiful? The sun projecting colorful rays of light as it shines through stained glass windows? Venus in a half shell by Botticelli? Or a full moon over a still lake in a mountain range? A consensus about the beauty of such things is not difficult to imagine. And that can bring us to the conclusion that beauty is universal, that beautiful things are innately beautiful, whether they are natural or created, and we can work from there to discover the elements that construct that beauty. Aristotle believed beauty to be a set of attributes that, if an object possesses, it would be perceived by all as beautiful. According to his account in Metaphysics, he says, The chief forms of beauty are order and symmetry and definiteness, which the mathematical sciences demonstrate in a special degree. And in Poetics, he says, To be beautiful, a living creature and every whole made up of parts must present a certain order in its arrangement of parts. In that sense, beauty is objective, since it doesn't depend on a subject's appraisal or judgment. Symmetry and the golden ratio are often used as measures of the physical beauty of the human face and form. You can think of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man in this instance. It is also sometimes used to argue that although some beauty standards are social constructs, some elements of physical beauty are universal and timeless, thanks to their mathematical proportions. On the other hand, mathematical beauty is a kind of delight at the simplicity, abstractness, and elegance of mathematics itself, rather than as an attribute that bestows beauty onto objects. According to research we'll discuss in part 4 of the video, mathematical beauty activates the same brain region that lights up when experiencing beauty from other sources. For Plato, mathematics is an unchanging truth that exists in the world of the abstract, just as beauty does, in a kind of supra-physical dimension beyond the world of form. For him, mathematics, as exemplified by the Pythagorean theorem, is an example of what beauty is. In Mysticism and Logic, Bertrand Russell says, Mathematics, rightly viewed, possesses not only truth, but supreme beauty. This brings us back to Keats's definition of beauty as truth and truth as beauty. As for elements that belong to the physical world, Plato insists they are not true causes of beauty, that they are mere reflections of its essence. They are its concauses. In that sense, Plato doesn't only reject the idea that beauty is subjective since it exists independently of the subject, but he doesn't even see it as truly objective either, as it exists beyond the object as well, belonging to the realm of the ideal, a kind of force or power that then sometimes lends itself to objects. Throughout recorded history, we have myths, legends, and true stories that tell of the power that the beauty of women held over men. And this power can be portrayed as either virtuous, inspiring great works of art, music, and architecture, like the Taj Mahal or Gustav Klimt's The Kiss, or as sinister, leading to war, death, and destruction, like the stories of Helen of Troy and Samson and Delilah. Many philosophies, religions, and teachings ranging from Eastern to Western across time and space talk about the power of beauty and the evils that it causes, not just in the world, but also in spirit. Sadly, that faulty association has caused much harm. Beauty standards have always been a long-reaching arm of the war machine. When those in power sought to stigmatize or demonize a certain race or people, 
They promoted the idea that their features and textures were ugly. I, for one, spent years of my adult life ironing my curls straight, not for fun, but for shame. I even once considered using a skin lightening cream when I was a child, but thankfully was dissuaded by my mother. Those are relics of a colonized mind, where I unconsciously sought to be more like our long-gone imperial colonizers in order to be seen as good, pure, intelligent, worthy, and beautiful. Have you ever heard of the statement, art for art's sake? This is a kind of slogan for the idea that art need not be created with a use in mind, that actually art should be divorced from utility, whether that be political, moralistic, or educational. Similarly, the Kantian tradition sees beauty as something we experience with a kind of disinterested pleasure that is separate from any practical purpose. In Kant's words, Taste is the faculty of judging an object or mode of representing it by an entirely disinterested satisfaction or dissatisfaction. The object of such satisfaction is called beautiful. On the opposite side stand other philosophers who have passionately argued that utility is what gives objects their beauty, that the beauty of a thing is how suited it is to its utility. This dichotomy is very, let's say, interestingly depicted in Xenophon's memorabilia book number three, where Socrates debates the hedonist Aristippus and says, Everything which we use is considered both good and beautiful from the same point of view, namely its use. And Aristippus then asks, Why then, is a dung basket a beautiful thing? And Socrates replies, Of course it is, and a golden shield is ugly if the one be beautifully fitted to its purpose, and the other ill. Just as with the objective-subjective debate, this can go on endlessly. But let's see if science can confirm one or other of these views. Some theories in evolutionary biology claim that human beings began to view things that were consistently helpful for survival as beautiful. Since symmetry delineates good genetic health, it made us see potentially healthy mates as beautiful. Also, buffalo with strong symmetrical horns were seen as a disease-free meal. Ratios and patterns in nature that predicted increased chances of survival in certain terrains or climates also became beautiful to us. And now we apply these symmetries, patterns, and ratios to our art and music and poetry to make them beautiful. This utilitarian root of beauty, even if beauty is no longer utilitarian, may be why different neuroscientific studies show that the brain areas involved in the valuation or appraisal of objects useful for survival and reproduction, like food and healthy mates, overlap with the brain areas that respond to artwork. Now here's where it gets very interesting. Putting a value on something heavily depends on our current internal state. Let's say you caught a horrible stomach flu and just finished vomiting, and then your friend shows up with your favorite pizza. Pure disgust, right? But if that had happened after a long day of work and barely eating anything at all, pure bliss instead. One of the areas responsible for making these kinds of appraisals is the anterior insula and it's part of your brain's introceptive system, the system that checks how you're doing internally. Other studies found other areas of the brain involved as well. The notable works of Samir Zeki, a pioneer of the field of neuroaesthetics, showed that the medial orbitofrontal cortex lights up when the subject experiences something as beautiful, whether it be a painting or a piece of music or a mathematical formula and that this same area is also activated when the subject is looking at something or someone they desire or love very much. However, a recent meta-analysis of 49 different studies with over 900 participants failed to find such common brain regions and shed doubt on these theories, leaving us once again with the question we started with. So I'm now going to spend the last few minutes of this video contemplating more spiritual perspectives of beauty. In 
In the poem on beauty by Khalil Gibran, one of the last lines reads, Beauty is eternity gazing at itself in the mirror. If you agree with Plato's ideal that beauty lies in the realm of the formless, then you might be inclined to see beauty having the quality of timelessness or eternity. Other philosophers added on to this idea by equating beauty with the divine, and that the sensual and aesthetic objects we delight in here in the world of form are just extensions of the beauty of God. Hegel believed that beauty is a bridge between the material and spiritual worlds. On the other hand, some traditions espouse that it is the fleetingness of things that allows us to appreciate their beauty. For example, the Japanese mono no aware, which is a term meaning the awareness of the transience of things, is what makes hundreds of thousands of Japanese engage in the tradition of hanami, or flower viewing. Usually they sit under cherry blossom trees and contemplate the impermanence of the blossoms, and in turn, reflect on the impermanence of all life as well. This contemplation is centuries old. For example, there was the silent flower sermon given by the Buddha, where he held up a single delicate flower and silently looked at it in the presence of his monks. All but one of the monks didn't really understand. The monk who did understand, Mahakasyapa, smiled, and his realization was handed down by 28 successors to later become the branch of Buddhism called Zen. That frailty, that transience of the beauty of a flower, can allow us to appreciate the little time we have on this earth, the beauty of the fragility of our lives. As Edmund Burke, a student of beauty and the sublime, said, an appearance of delicacy and even fragility is almost essential to beauty. Samir Zeki's work showed that our brains experience that which we love and long for as beautiful. And in certain languages, those two concepts are actually quite related, if not one and the same. Love is a constant desire to possess or merge with the object of desire, be it a person or a thing or an ideal. And that object of longing is what we perceive as beautiful. I personally find this idea of love as longing for union to be most hauntingly encapsulated by Sufi poets, whose poems are dedicated to their longing for divine reunion, though in ways that mirror the earthliest of passions. Rumi describes his desire in this vivid way. Suddenly, the drunken sweetheart appeared out of my door. She drank a cup of ruby wine and sat by my side. Seeing and holding the lockets of her hair, my face became all eyes, and my eyes all hands. That longing, that desire for unity, can be conceived of as a longing for completeness. For me, I like the Jungian idea that anything external that affects us strongly is a reflection of something internal we might be denying or suppressing into the shadow. So perhaps when we find something movingly beautiful, we are longing to reunite with that same beauty within ourselves in order to become complete, to find our own wholeness and unity. As the infamous 20th century occultist Alistair Crowley said, I am divided for love's sake, for the chance of union. Interestingly, in Arabic, the word for completeness is kamel, which also means wholeness, integrity, and perfection. Do you know what the Arabic word for beauty is? It's a very similar one, and I'll let you look it up. For now, I'll leave you with the Khalil Gibran poem right here. And I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you soon. Goodbye for now.